We were evil children, seeds of the devil. Being raised by a psychopathic mother can create many sequelae that we are sometimes unable to recognize. These harmful people often leave a serious emotional mark on us with long-term consequences. Our mother plays a very important role in the correct development of our social skills during childhood. A stage in which we establish our first bonds and in which our parents are responsible for providing us with stability in order to grow up in a healthy way. This lack of security on our mother's part makes us more vulnerable to any kind of emotional instability. It is very hard to recognize that a person as important as our mother is capable of hurting us so much. But it is even harder to accept the fact that she does not love us. Sacramento, California, United States. Teresa Knorr was born in 1946 in a middle-class family but with economic problems. Her father, a cheesemaker by profession, had retired after being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, which had reduced the family's income. On the other hand, the mother, who had raised the children, died of a heart problem when Teresa was just a teenager. The young woman was devastated. At only 15 years of age, she had just lost her reference in life. However, fate had a pleasant surprise in store for her. Perhaps by way of compensation. Teresa met Clifford Sanders, a man five years her senior, for whom she left school in 1962 to marry him. Teresa gave birth to Howard, their first child. But all that happiness and harmony soon turned into a real torment. Now the fights were continuous. Teresa was suspicious of Clifford. She accused him of being unfaithful and of mistreatment. One day, she even came close to filing a complaint at the police station. The situation at home was already untenable. Until, in one of those arguments, Clifford told her that he was leaving her, just at the moment when Teresa was pregnant with Shayla, their second daughter. However, the man didn't even have time to walk out the door. Teresa grabbed a shotgun. She pulled the trigger and shot him in the chest. Clifford died instantly. Teresa, when officers arrived at the home, argued endlessly that the shooting had been in self-defense for fear of losing her life. I grabbed a shotgun to keep him from hitting me and it exploded, she claimed. But Donald Dorfman, the deputy district attorney, was clear. It is first degree murder. Not all homicidal women look like the witch in Snow White. The fact that she is pregnant has nothing to do with her shooting her husband maliciously, he asserted. So he accused her of taking Clifford's life in cold blood and making up those explanations to avoid prison. So Teresa went to trial, and when it was her turn to speak, she took the stand, broken with grief, crying. Describing to the jurors the alleged history of abuse she had suffered at the hands of her husband. The testimony of Leroy Walter, her psychologist, supported her defense. Of her, he said she was frightened, regretful, even anxious. That she was incapable of taking someone's life with premeditation, and that she had acted in self-defense. Thus, on September 22, 1964, after an hour and 45 minutes of deliberation, the jury found Teresa not guilty, and finally, she was released. From this point on, Teresa, completely unleashed, took refuge in drink. 
and she accused her children of being the reason for all her problems. Thus, Teresa began to emerge the monster inside her. In 1966, Teresa married again, this time to Private Robert Knorr, from whom she adopted his last name. Together, they had four children, Susan, William, Robert, and Terry. But their marriage didn't work out either. Teresa then tried her luck with two more men, a railroad man and a journalist. Both unions were unsuccessful. At only 30 years old, Teresa was already divorced for the fourth time. And the problem was not her partners, the problem was her. Teresa was out of control, unhinged and seriously affected by her irresponsible drinking. An anger and frustration that she always took out on those who deserved it the least, her children. Teresa forced them to practice all kinds of torture. She would make them sit still on the kitchen floor to slap them. She would throw razors at them. She would point a gun at their heads. She would put cigarettes out on their skin. It, it was a real torment. Above all, the children were forbidden to talk about what was going on inside the house. That's why the neighborhood did not perceive such a degree of humiliation. In the words of Susan Sullivan, one of the neighbors, I knew they were weird, but I didn't know they were so weird. Teresa was especially vicious towards Susan and Shayla. Against them, she felt a special animosity. The adolescent beauty of her two daughters had awakened in her a sick envy. She accused them of being witches and of performing all kinds of spells against her to make her put on weight and lose her physical attractiveness. On one occasion, Teresa placed a pot of hot food between Susan's legs. She forced her to eat it all. Afterwards, she gave her a tremendous baiting. Still, the young woman managed to escape and call the police for help. But when the officers arrived at the house, Teresa told them that Susan had mental problems. She needed a psychiatrist, and that her testimony was fabricated. Unfortunately, the officers believed the mother's false story and left. Days after that incident, Teresa beat Susan again. But this time, she implicated the rest of her children in the act. She forced them to tie her to the bed, to inflict pain on her in turn, and she forbade them to feed her more than twice a day. Finally, she decided to let Susan go when she swore and swore she would never escape again. But the years passed, and the abuse continued. Until, in 1982, Teresa's contempt for Susan reads to speak. And after a brutal fight, the mother pulled out a gun and opened fire on her daughter's chest. Teresa had gone too far. She knew it had been excessive, and worse, she knew that if anyone found out what had happened, she could end up in prison. So she asked her kids to help her cure Susan. So they put her in the bathtub and they managed to sew up her wound. They had made a mistake. They had not removed the bullet, a fatal fact that would soon make her life impossible. Susan was in great pain. It was unbearable, insufferable. She could no longer endure such an ordeal. So she let Teresa stick a pair of scissors in her back in exchange for healing her bullet wound. Susan desperately needed to get out of there. So she promised her mother that she would have the bullet removed before she left. That way, she would have no evidence to report her to the police. Thus, the kitchen floor became the operating table, and a bottle of whiskey began to serve as an anesthetic. The moment had arrived. Teresa took a razor and proceeded to open the wound. Blood, blood, and more blood. However, the mother failed to remove the bullet, and Susan, in such intolerable pain, lost consciousness. There was little to be done. 
Despite the antibiotics she was given, Susan's health continued to deteriorate. Her wound was seriously infected. The situation was untenable. Susan was screaming in pain. Fearing that the neighbors would hear her, Teresa gucked her. She tied her hands and feet. She took her to a bridge near Placer County, and with the help of her sons, William and Robert, she burned her alive. With Susan's passing, the siblings were completely terrified. Everything was fear, panic, terror of their mother. It was then that Teresa began to make Shayla's life miserable. The mother became obsessed with the idea that her daughter was pregnant and that a disease had been passed on to her. Of course, both beliefs were false. But when Shayla wouldn't confess, Teresa didn't hesitate to beat her to a pulp. She ended up locking her in a closet next to the bathroom. Shayla could not get out of there under any circumstances, nor eat, nor drink, nor could she be held by their brothers. Nothing. Help me, help me, she cried. But after several days of crying, Shayla stopped complaining, and a foul stench began to fill the house. Then the brothers opened the closet door and found Shayla in the fetal position. No wailing, no sobbing, lifeless. Teresa feared the neighborhood would notice the rotten smell. So she planned to get rid of the body. So she ordered William and Robert to take Shayla's remains to the mountains. Thus, in a field near the Truckee airport, in a makeshift coffin, William and Robert abandoned her deceased sister. And again, before leaving, they set fire to it. Hours later, Elmer Barber, a local resident, came upon Shayla's decomposed and charred body. So he quickly called the authorities. But after hours of searching for clues, they were unable to identify who the remains belonged to. So, they decided to call her Jane Doe. On the other hand, Teresa was worried. She believed that if the investigators ended up discovering that the lifeless young woman was her daughter, the closet in which she had been locked would give her away. So, she ordered Terry to burn the house down. Thus, the fire raised the entire home to the ground. Everything except one piece of furniture. The closet where Shayla had died. After the incident, Teresa and her children separated and went their separate ways. Except for Robert, who remained at his mother's side. The others got their lives back on track. Until almost nine years later, Terry, with a great sense of guilt behind him, decided to report the murders. And he recounted the events to Ron Perea, a Nevada County sergeant. To her mother, we were evil children, seeds of the devil, he explained. Over the course of several hours, Terry told him about the molestations perpetrated by his mother. And he gave him the exact locations where she had abandoned the burned bodies years before. After reviewing previous files, the sergeant discovered that the report on Jane Doe matched Terry's account. The remains did indeed belong to Shayla. In addition, the investigators were able to identify Susan's body. Thus, finally, William, Robert, and of course, Teresa were arrested. Regarding the arrest of her children, William was released while Robert was declared an accomplice in Shayla's death. He was sentenced to three years in prison. Teresa was charged with murder and conspiracy. Although she initially claimed to be innocent of all charges, after sensing that her children would turn her in, she pleaded guilty. She believed that this would reduce her sentence and that she would escape capital punishment. Fortunately, her plan worked, and on October 15, 1995, Teresa was sentenced to two life sentences.
During the trial, the magistrate called Teresa's martyrs callousness beyond belief. In fact, her profile even appears on the so-called Evil Index, a scale based on the research of Dr. Michael Stone, which describes the worst martyrs in history. According to Michael himself, the motivations that led Teresa to end the lives of her daughters reached Category 22, the highest category contemplated, that of psychopaths. In California, there was a woman who ruled her family home by means of humiliations, beatings, intimidations, and in the last case, homicides. She was Teresa Noor, the psychopathic mother who tormented her daughters. 